when we were coming up through school. And it's that passion that makes you one of the leading science advocates in America. One of the students we recently hosted at our leadership conference this last summer, at the Center for Inquiries Student Leadership Conference, this is a conference where we bring in college students from around North America for a weekend of training on what we call science advocacy. Well, one of these students is a budding astrophysicist. Her name's Adria Updike. She's studying at Clemson University. Question, what advice would you give to budding astrophysicists? I mean, why should people be studying? astrophysics? Well, I don't care so much whether people study astrophysics. I just care that they're scientifically literate. And what they do with it after that, I think, no matter what it is, society will be healthier. Now, if in particular, among all of the things that you question about the world, you're especially intrigued by what's above your head, then, by the way, when I was a kid and I first took interest in the universe, it was so amazing to me. I thought to myself, you know, everybody's going to want to do this. Maybe there'll be no room for me because, of course, this is, it's so obvious that this is what everyone will want to study. And then I found out, no, you know, some people want to be artists or they want to write novels. But if you want to sort of grow up and be an astrophysicist, of course, the most fundamental thing you need to familiarize yourself with are the laws of physics of the cosmos. And many professional astrophysicists majored in physics in college, as did I, for example. Knowing all along, I would choose a graduate school that would tune and focus my energies and interest into questions that relate to the cosmos. So when in college, take as much math and physics as you can, because this stokes your capacity to inquire. You know what kinds of questions to ask, and you know where to draw upon to answer them. The better equipped you are to think about a problem you've never seen before, the better able you will be to answer it. And you don't want to be stuck not having some branch of mathematics available to you if the answer to this next problem you just found required that branch of math. So you want to be ready for it. And then you've got to really love it, because graduate school is not a picnic. You need a good advisor, and it's a lot of years. You spend more years in graduate school studying one subject than you did in college, you know, taking classes in all manner of subjects. So it's a, re- it's a time of focus. And so you've got to grow accustomed to focusing, where not much else in your life can have priority. Now, if that's going to be a problem for you, then there are plenty of other things you can do. In fact, even if you don't become an astrophysicist, you can become one vicariously because there are all tons of books that people write on what's going on in the universe. You know, the astronomy aisle of Barnes & Noble or Borders Books is one of the biggest aisles there is. Just take a look at it. It, No other science subject compares to it. There's not an aisle that large in geology, but popular-level books on the subject that come out every month or every few weeks, or in biology, unless it's health-related, of course, that's a big area, or in chemistry, it's just not done. So the appetite for the cosmos is real whether or not you do it professionally or vicariously. And you're saying there are a lot of ways to satisfy that appetite. You have a DVD series out with a company called The Teaching Company. They go out there and find the best teachers, best professors in America, record them, make them available. You have one on the cosmos. So if someone's interested in this subject, that would be another great way to uh, begin their exploration. Yeah, I could say, you know, buy all my stuff, I could say that. But but I am one of many people who have invested significant parts of time that they might have otherwise been on vacation, where they might have otherwise spent with family, but they themselves felt committed to write a book or do a video series or write op-eds to the papers. They want to bring the fruits of their research to the public. And astronomers know this better than anyone, and Carl Sagan really carved the path that enabled the rest of us to do this without being judged by our colleagues. Because in astrophysics, we know that most of what we do is paid for by tax money through grants from NASA or the National Science Foundation. And so without that, we don't have a job. Without the public's appetite for what we do, we'd be pumping gas. So... That awareness, which started in a very big public way with Carl Sagan, now permeates the entire astrophysics community. And I'm proud to say that about my my fellow scientists. So it's no longer bad to be an, in quotes, 
popularizer of science. You don't want to be a popularizer at the expense of your integrity and your accuracy and the normal care that you would place in, in communicating information. Popularizing doesn't mean dumbing down. Right. It means respecting the intelligence of who you're speaking to and giving them the thoughts that will elevate them for that day. You just spoke eloquently about the public's appetite for science, their wonder at their place in the universe. You're in charge of a planetarium that is in that market. It's world-renowned for its outreach to the public, its educational initiatives. Uh, what would you say to students, even young children, as they're coming through the planetarium? They're just getting interested in the sciences in the first place. Uh, or what about what would you say to parents? How can educators, parents foster this kind of love, the same kind of zeal that's so evident uh, when someone talks to you? Well, I have two small children of my own, and I've watched them develop. One is 10 and one is 5. And I keep thinking, I know what I need to do. My next book has to be How to Raise a Scientifically Literate Child. I haven't done it yet, but that's, that's on my list. That's, I'm going to do that. Part of the way to succeed, I believe, is to get out of their way. I get so often asked by adults, what do I need to do for my kids to get them interested in science? Get out of their way. When the kid goes into the, the cabinet where the pots and pans are and starts slamming on the top with a wooden spoon, don't say, cut out that noise and close the cabinet. These are experiments in acoustics, in sound, <laughs> in the <laughs> vibration patterns of metal, in the in structural integrity of wooden spoons. These are science experiments. When my kids used to play with their peas, my son, you know, you have to overcook the peas so they don't choke. Well, he would take a pea, drop it on the ground, and just watch it kind of stick to the ground. Most parents would say, don't do that, you're playing with your food. Uh, no, nah. he was watching what's called in physics an inelastic collision, where the pea smashes into a flat shape on the ground. The pea does not bounce. Why doesn't it bounce? Well, because it's mushy. This is useful information. When my daughter spilled milk and watched it puddle up and trickle through the eaves of the table and dribble down to the floor, I think most parents would have immediately cleaned it up and said, be careful next time. But I let it go because she was watching the milk dribble and wondered where it went. And she figured, well, it went through the crack. It had to go somewhere. And then put her head under the table and saw it drip down to the floor. These are experiments in hydrodynamics. So you're saying that all children, because of their natural childhood curiosity, we were all budding scientists as, as little kids. You said it right. All kids are scientists. They just don't have the tools yet to deduce the formal nature of things, but they are exploring the world around them. And another one, let's say it's cold outside and it's icy, and there's, a, and, there's a, and there's a frozen puddle in front of them, the kid might run onto the puddle. What do the parents say? Don't do that, you might fall. Well, you know, kids hardly ever get hurt when they fall. Remember how close they are to the ground? <laughs> this is an important fact. So let them slide down on the ice, and you know something? They'll fall. And they'll realize that ice is slippery, and that wet ice is slipperier than ice that's not wet. And this is all experimentation. So I try to surround my kids with things that they can do without instruction that bring them closer to the laws of physics. And when you do that, you breed within them a kind of scientific literacy where the world is not just a place where magical things happen. The world is a place of causes and effects. And if that's what you can instill in your kids, you're done. You're done because the rest takes care of itself. Now, you want to take them to a museum or you take them to a place where now you can light a flame under them. And upon doing that, then they say, well, I want to be a geologist or a chemist or a biologist. And then, then that curiosity can take shape. That's the next phase of developing the, the, the scientific literacy. But it takes a lot less effort than you think. Especially if those seeds were planted already. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Tyson, one last question. Even given your success at bringing science, the appreciation of science, its beauty, its wonder to the public, do you think that science, the public understanding and appreciation of science, you think it's winning ground or is it losing ground? I guess what I'm asking is with all the anti-science trends in the culture uh, we touched on earlier in our conversation, why is it that you seem so gosh darned hopeful? DJ, once again, you ask the perfect question. I'll tell you why I'm hopeful. You know, I did three tours of duty in the Bush administration, serving twice as commissioner on two commissions, once as a 
member of a committee that in fact advised